Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Acts and the Apostles, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Um, before I dive into the scripture, um, if you, any of y'all have ever watched network television and watched like a big dramatic network TV series, they will often open an episode with previously on. I watched a lot of Grey's Anatomy back in the day, and it's like previously on Grey's Anatomy. This is essentially previously on the book of Luke, because Acts of the Apostles is the sequel uh, to the book of Luke, and Acts chapter 1 is literally just the end of the book of Luke again. So you can imagine the book of Luke was like season one that ended with this cliffhanger of Jesus ascending into heaven and they open up season two of the book of Luke called Acts of the Apostles with a recap of previously on the book of Luke. And so now I give you previously on the book of Luke. In the first book, Theophilus, literally, is previously on Luke. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instruction through the Spirit, to, through the Holy Spirit, to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them, stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking upward, upward toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Say is God's good word for us, God's beloved people. Thanks be to God. Amen. So, I'm going to make an assumption that I am among friends here. That, that, that we are friends, uh, and so I, I'm going to admit a couple things uh, about my life and about my ministry that are, in some ways, somewhat embarrassing, and I do not want you walking out of this service going, man, why did we get this guy as our pastor? Keep in mind, we've been together for three years now, so like, you know, it seems to have gone okay. The simple fact about the beginning of my ministry is that I was picked last to receive a church. I went through the, so the Methodist ordination process and the giving out of church to the Methodist church does very much go like uh, either a sorority rush or you're picking a, a softball team in gym class where there are a bunch of people and saying, I'll take this one. And then that person says, I'll take this one. And that person says, I'll take this one um, until there are no spots left or there are no people left. And I was picked last. I got assigned a church last. I got assigned a church in the middle of nowhere that they thought was going to close. Because uh, again, I got picked last. It's kind of embarrassing, but is true. And how it happened is at least informative. See, the years of 2012 and 2013 were fairly depressing for me. I got back from Kenya, um, missions in Kenya and Peru, with my body just profoundly busted. I had gotten real sick in Kenya. I had broken my, shattered my foot really in Peru. And so like I was in a, on crutches and in a, in a cast for like five months upon getting back from many months of missions. Uh, my doctor before I left uh, for Kenya was like, how long do you want to live? I said, a while. She said, you're going to have to make some changes. Like, I, my body was deeply unhealthy. I had just started, I had um, taken a break from the seminary side of things. I was in the public health school side of things, where I was one of, like, four Christians in the sea of a thousand. And so the other kids at school did not like me very much. 
Um, on top of that, Atlanta is made of hills, and so I'm like crutching on hills um, day after day and largely falling over a lot. And so that's all awful. The first year of public health school, they tell you there are all these problems in the world and you're never going to fix them. We call year one tragedies and year two strategies. And so I was stuck in year one tragedies. And so anyways, by about, oh, also I had a job that I absolutely hated. I worked as the director of young adult ministries at a church that I will not name because it was a terrible job. They paid me $5,000 a year to solve all of their young adult problems because they just kind of looked at like, ah, I need like a 26 year old to fix our problems. You're 26, fix our problems. It's not, it, no. By the way, that's not, it's never going to work. You're never going to fix your young adult problems by f throwing five grand in some pizza at a 26 year old. Just not how that works. So I hated my job. School was not going well. My body was deeply screwed up. And so by about February of 2013, I stopped turning in papers, which is really not an avenue for academic success. You do not do well in graduate school if you literally stop turning in papers. All grad school is, is going to class and writing papers. I need to make a change in my life. And I really did not like where my life was. And I really did not want to or feel led to continue in that same way. I needed to make a change. And what I felt led to do was finally go into pastoral ministry, which is the thing I felt called to to begin with. It's why I was there in Atlanta in the first place was to become a pastor. So I decided to fill out my application and turn in my application to no longer be someone's terribly paid intern to solve their problems, but to actually be a pastor, preaching every Sunday, doing the pastoral care work, doing the church organizing work, leading a congregation as I always felt led to. The application was due in December, and it said in the paperwork that you're supposed to find out by the end of February. So I worked hard and I got my application turned in. And then I went off on Christmas break and I was fine. And I came back from Christmas break and it was January and I was fine. And then it was February and I, I was good. I hadn't heard anything, but you know, it's, it's February. And then February ended and I said, well, February is a short month. And so maybe they just got a little busy. Then it was March. Well, then it was the end of March. Uh, uh, I didn't hear anything. And then it was April, and now we're way far away from when I was supposed to hear something, and, and I still didn't hear anything. And then it was the end of April, and then it was May, and then I definitely had to like do all the weird internship paperwork so I could stay at my current job, because in seminary you have to have a ministry placement, as it turns out. So I had to like go to my boss and go to this megalomaniac worship leader that I worked with and like, can you sign my paperwork so I can be a 27-year-old intern? Okay. And then it was the second week of May. I didn't hear anything. And at this point, like, my thumb is kind of broken from hitting refresh on my email so often. I'm, like, starting to wear a divot in the phone, a phone screen of my iPhone because I just keep hitting the refresh button of, like, show me, show me the emails. I need to see the emails. I need to see the emails. They keep not being what I want. I need to see the emails. And the email never came. It's the third week of May. And the fourth week of May. And now I'm starting to, like, Get my, I'm it's getting to the summer, which if I wasn't going to become a pastor, it's time for once again Trey to ship himself off to some strange country and do even stranger things when I get there. And so I was working on getting my office set up in Paraguay, working on getting my team over, and working on building security protocols for these crazy people that do not understand how to stay alive in foreign countries. And so I'm doing all of that work, and I'm about, I'm booking my flights and packing. Uh, I didn't pack ahead of time. That's funny. I'm getting my stuff vaguely together, making sure I have enough meds to put in my backpack. And I, I'm getting ready to do all the normal things. And I'm all, all while I'm running down my phone battery every day by clicking refresh on my email, hoping to God someone will email me. And by the fourth week of May, 2013... As I'm watching, all of my friends have had their placements for months. And one guy's at like 
than this like super rich community in suburban Atlanta. And this other person is like next to a historic graveyard, which didn't work out real well for him, but he didn't know that at the time. And like all my other friends have had these placements. I had a really unfortunate run in with a bishop where like him and I met in a corridor and it was like, what? what's, what's going on? I need, I need. He didn't tell me anything. I'm not sure I was comprehensible, but you know. I just kept waiting. And here's the other confession is I am really bad at waiting when I do not have a definite endpoint to the waiting. I do pretty well if I know when the thing is going to end, right? With the birth of our children. Um, although, you know, this most recent one was uniquely stressful. Like, you kind of know, like, if you hit 41 weeks, that doctor is one way or another is taking that baby out of there, right? Like, there is a definite end, medical endpoint to that. I was always fine in school because there's a definite end to the school year. It is, by the way, to all the teachers in the audience, very soon. There is a definite end when those snotty, loud, annoying beings, I mean, lovely children of God, leave your classroom to not return turned for months. And I really didn't love it that one year when I was teaching, when the school year got extended by two years, I about committed mutiny. Um, but like, there's a definite end point. And so I can fine with that. What I'm really bad at is suffering with no end point. The like, waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and hurting, and worrying, and fearing, or whatever is going on, on, and on, and on, with no definite end. I think about that, that feeling of waiting. Every time I read Luke's second account of Jesus ascending into the sky. Because in Luke 1, the Gospel of Luke, it is basically like Jesus finishes talking to his friends and then he ascends into heaven. But here in Luke 2, Acts of the Apostles, we get a lot more about what Jesus says to them on his way out the door. And what Jesus says to them is, okay, look, friends, I know that I, Jesus, have been doing all the talking and all the going and all the miracles and all the healing and all the dying and all of the raising from the dead. And I've been doing all of it. Uh, now you're going to do it. Don't feel like you can. It's fine. It's fine. The power to do it will come. Don't worry, I'm not going to tell you when it's going to come, but the power to do it is going to come, and up I go into heaven. And so you can imagine Jesus' friends standing there going, Bye, Jesus! Oh, God! We're so screwed. Right, please? imagine that feeling you've been told oh don't worry this power to do all these things to go to jerusalem and judea and samaria and the ends of the earth all this power to do all of that is going to come don't worry when is it going to come soon i mean here i'll pick up in verse four I hear it from in jesus own words while staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then, whoop, dink, off into the sky, Jesus goes. And there his friends are, waving Jesus goodbye, feeling utterly powerless, slightly afraid, and deeply worried about what comes next. So then they gather in a room, much like, actually much the size of this one, 
hundred people waiting in that room, largely staring at each other awkwardly, waiting for something to happen. Has the, has the spirit hit you yet? Has the spirit hit you yet? Is something, is something happening? Is something happening? Day one was probably fine. Jesus had just left. Day two, they started to get hungry and probably sent out for some food. Uh, day three, they realized they were going to need a lot more food because now at this point they're stress eating. Day four, they realized maybe someone should have taken the trash out. Day five, they finally decide by vote to make John take the trash out as the youngest. Uh, day six, they realized everyone definitely should have showered before locking themselves in this room. Day seven, they realized they were going to need more than one toilet corner, and this was all about to fall apart badly. Uh, day eight, uh, they decided to name, to rename everyone and give themselves different names. Uh, day nine, they elected a coconut as their leader. And then on the 10th day, the Holy Spirit shows up, but they didn't know that on day 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And no matter how much food they ate, they could not, like, heal the hole in their soul it took to wait and wait and wait, not knowing when it was going to end. And so, yeah, spoiler alert, Pentecost happens. The Holy Spirit shows up. You still have to show up next week because we're going to talk more about the Holy Spirit. But, like, look, that promise from Jesus happens. Holy Spirit descends, and they do rush out, and they can now speak all the languages, and Peter can preach now all of a sudden, and they can heal people, and they bring in thousands, and it's all this stuff we've been reading about for weeks starts to happen. It works. But on like day five of sitting and staring at each other and trying not to fart audibly, look, fear makes you gassy. It's a hundred people trapped in a room. What do you think? They're terrified, and it's suffering without end. What they have is this calling to go out in the world, to Jerusalem, to Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And they've promised that this spirit is going to show up and give them the ability to do it. That doesn't make waiting without ending any easier. They're just supposed to be, sit there and be patiently expectant. And the Holy Spirit does show up. And they do go out. And it does work, or all of us would not be here if they hadn't received the Spirit and they hadn't gone out and done all the things that they were supposed to do. And there's another promise that they're given. Not just the Holy Spirit, but when these angels show up and tell them to stop looking up with their noses in the air, you'll get rain. Here again, verses 10 and 11. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go. That first promise that they got that day, the Holy Spirit would show up, Ten days later, on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit showed up. The second promise, that Jesus would come back the same way they saw him come. They're standing there waving, hoping he'll come back really soon. Hadn't happened yet, right? 2,000 years on, it hasn't happened yet. That's why it's probably good that they didn't stand there that whole time. It would just be like a pile of bones somewhere in, somewhere in Judea of, you know, a hundred people who stood there and waved themselves to death for generations. We're still waiting on that promise. And everything that goes with it, right? That Christ will come in final victory. That Christ will, Christ coming back means that everything will be set right. That every knee will bow. That every tongue will confess. That everything that is wrong with the world will be right. That there'll be no more war. That everyone will have what they need. That everyone will feel the abundant love of God. That those who have wrecked the world will be judged. And those who have fought to save it will be celebrated. All of those things is a promise sitting out there that even the early church thought was going to happen like next Tuesday and they're writing to Paul Paul should I buy milk or is Jesus going to come back and so I don't need milk and eventually even Paul had to say chill out folks buy milk buy eggs have kids settle in 
And even the book of Revelation isn't about, yo, everything's gonna burn. The book of Revelation, if you actually read it, says, hang in there. All of this suffering you are going through now will be okay because you have this promise from God that God will set everything right. How do we know that? How can we believe that this promise that Jesus is going to come back and all of the problems of this world are going to go away? How do we know to trust that? That's why we read this. This is not just a book. This is a catalog of all of the promises that God has kept. That as Jesus ascended into heaven, he promised that he would be with them, that he would come down in the Holy Spirit and empower them to do mighty things. And 10 days later, there the Holy Spirit was. Touch, hitting them like tongues of fire, driving them out in the street in ministry. In the Last Supper, Jesus gathered his friends around him and said, look, I'm going to die. It's for you. And on the third day, I'm going to rise from the dead. And, they had, and he made that promise. I'll be back. And they had to sit there and watch him get murdered brutally. Watch him get put in a tomb and a giant stone get rolled away. And know that behind there is their friend slowly rotting to dust. But on the third day, the first day of the week, they go to prepare the body. And there instead is an empty tomb. And a teacher come back with holes in his hands and holes in his side with a message that God's grace has been released in the world because even death could not hold him. He kept that promise. 400 years before that, the people of, it, the people of, of Judea, God's people, looked around and nothing looked right. The, there was not a godly king on the throne of David. They were ruled by the Persians that they, everything was wrong, but the prophets, the prophets kept telling them, Keep, hold on, someday there will be a godly king seated on the throne of David. Someday God will show up and make right that of his kingdom there will be no end, that a, someone from the house of David will ascend the throne of his ancestor David, and God will rule over God's people forever. And they waited for 400 years. And then one night, in the city of Judea called Bethlehem, a child was born. It was Jesus Christ, God with us, our Emmanuel, descended from the house of David, destined to sit at the throne of David forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. It was a promise kept. You can keep going back, right? When the people were in exile in Babylon, they were promised that they would come home and they would rebuild their temple. And yeah, did it take 70 years? Yes, it did. But in the book of Nehemiah, we read clearly that the temple and the wall got rebuilt and they gathered the whole nation together and rededicated themselves to God. And you go back to our earliest history when, when a covenant was made with Abraham saying, I will be your God and you will be my people. And even the thousands and millions of times where we have not been God's people, God has has always been our God. God has always kept God's promises. That's what's in this book. It's not that I think reading ancient literature is healthy for you or for me or for anybody. And it's not like I love it. I don't just like love reading lists of random names. No, this is a book of God's promises kept so that we can look forward that God will keep the one promise that still remains out there. So that we can keep the hope and wait patiently expectant, patiently expectant, and that we can continue on the mission that we have. See the disciples there in that room staring at each other and trying not to smell at each other and getting mad because that guy's looking at me funny, had a mission from God, carry the good news to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, and they had a promise that the Spirit would come. 
We have that same mission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go to Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and to the ends of the earth. And we have a promise that Christ will come back and everything will be set right. If only we would be patient and hopeful and keep following our mission and have faith that God would keep that promise as God has kept all of the other promises. The very end of May in 2013, it was days away from getting on a plane to go to Paraguay for four months. I get an email. I'm at the intersection of North Druid Hills and Claremont Drive in Atlanta. It is illegal in the state of Georgia to look at your phone while you're driving. I was looking at my phone while I was driving. I can picture this moment clearly. I was once again wearing out the refresh function on my email. At this point, I was not checking my email out of hope. I was checking my email out of weird psychological compulsion. Just keep clicking this button. I had become addicted to clicking the button. I didn't think anything was going to happen. I would love to say, and I waited patiently for God because I'm such a great man of faith. Nope. I'd given up hope. That's how you know I've given up hope. I use my Mike Tyson voice whenever I'm giving up hope. I'm Mike Tyson. But then there was this email from the Reverend Herzen Adoni, the district superintendent of the Northwest District, saying, Trey, we have a church for you. It's called Smith Chapel United Methodist Church. It's in a place called Tunnel Hill, Georgia. You have not heard of any of these things, but they're ready for you if you will come. Four months later, I land back from Paraguay on August the 1st. I drive almost immediate, Sydney drives me almost immediately to a department store for me to buy some actual human clothing, because uh, missionaries do not wear human clothes. And two days later, on August the 3rd, I became the pastor in charge at Smith Chapel United Methodist Church. Picked last, but God had made me that promise in 2006 that you are to become a pastor. And God had led me to put in that application And although it did not happen on my time, God kept God's promise for me that day. And kind of the rest is history, therefore I'm here. But friends, part of this waiting expectantly is maintaining that hope that I admit I lost. I am not good at this. This sermon is as much for me as the rest of you to maintain that hope and to continue to get out there even as it seems that Jesus is never coming back. Jesus is coming back. This world will be set right, but we've got to maintain that hope and keep doing the things that will be a part of God setting that all of these things right. The first book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, opens in a very interesting way. It says not these are the things that happened, but a better translation of the Greek is These were the things that were made to happen. That is to say that especially Luke wants us to know that we have a role to play in doing God's work in the world and bringing about the things we want God to do in the world. Luke wants us to know that we are God's hands and God's feet. Is God working through us? Yeah. Is it all God and very little us? Yes. But we still need to maintain the faith. We still need to maintain the hope. We still need to get out there and do the things that God is indeed calling us and empowering us to do. We have a mission to go and make disciples. We have the power of the Holy Spirit with us that cannot be defeated. And we have a promise that Jesus will come back and all will be set right. May we keep our hope, seeing that God has kept every other promise. And get out there. Do the things that transforms this world by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Gracious loving God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for all of the promises that you have kept up to now, for always being our God, even when we have not always been your people, for saving us, for empowering us, for being right here with us. And so God, may we indeed have faith. And God, may we indeed have hope. 
that even as we look at a world that is not quite right, we can be a part of you making it right and have that hope and that assurance and that faith that you will indeed come in final victory and we will indeed feast at that heavenly banquet. In Jesus' most holy name we pray, amen. God has a mission for us. God has made us a promise. God keeps God's promises. Let us all get out there. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come in peace. Amen.